हेलो हेलो इज इट ओके एल्बर्ट जेड वन सेड रिसर्च इज टू research is to see what everybody else has seen and to think what nobody else has thought only one who has keen eye for detail with sustained focus and intellect can bring about change and create wonders zora hello hello is it okay sir is that is this Zora Neale Hurston once said research is formalized curiosity it is poking and prying with a purpose a very good morning to one and all present here today i rishit along with my co-host saili from mbbs phase 1 extend a hearty welcome to you all present here for today's distinguished lecture by renowned professor nanduri r prabhakar sir may i now request dr lata maldur ma'am director of iqac and professor of physiology to kindly welcome the gathering a very good morning to everyone gathered here respected our chief guest professor nanduri prabhakar sir honorable pro chancellor sir professor jairaj sir honorable vice chancellor dr r s mudo sir honorable pro vice chancellor dr arun inamda sir registrar dr arvi kulkarni sir dean faculty of medicine dr arvin patil sir professor kushal das sir other dignitaries faculties and my dear students on behalf of bld deemed to be university i cordially and respectfully welcome professor nanduri prabhakar who is currently holding the position of herald hine endowed professor of medicine at university of chicago and invited member of nobel forum karolinska institute stockholm dr prabhakar is a world renowned scientist and co discoverer of oxygen sensing pathway and signal molecule along with the nobel laureate dr greg simenza we are certainly grateful to him for accepting our invitation to be the distinguished speaker of today's scientific program and grace the occasion to make this event possible the credit goes to professor kusal das distinguished chairperson who is instrumental in inviting his two decade old friend professor nanduri prabhakar to our university which is pleasurably supported by all our administrative authorities sir it is moment of honor and pleasure for our university to have your magnanimous presence in today's event we all are truly inspired especially at laboratory of vascular physiology and medicine of department of physiology by our by your work on hypoxia pathophysiology and its regulatory system to discover several drugs to treat it your presence here at this event will not only inspire us all to be highly motivated but also urge us all to try for excellence in the research to improve quality of life for human kind just as you did we look forward to learning from you sir i also take this opportunity to welcome various heads of the institution faculty members and students of shri b m patil medical college and also various higher education institutions of bld association once again on behalf of bldedu i extend a very warm welcome to our chief guest and all you present here to the distinguished lecture thank you thank you ma'am now i request dr shri lakshmi bagri ma'am associate professor of physiology and assistant director and coordinator of laboratory of vascular physiology 
and Medicine, Department of Physiology, to introduce our today's chief guest. Respected dignitaries, esteemed chief, chief guest of today, Professor Nanduri Prabhakar, sir, learned members, faculty from Sister Concerns, students, research scholars, a very good morning to one and all. It's both an honor and privilege to introduce Professor Nanduri R. Prabhakar, a renowned physiologist and researcher par excellence who has done pioneering work on how cells sense and adapt to oxygen availability. Professor Nanduri Prabhakar did his PhD in physiology from M MS University, Vadodara, and subsequently did his DSc from Ruhr University, Germany. He is currently Harold Heinz Endowed Professor of Medicine and Inaugural Director of the Institute for Integrative Physiology and Center for Systems Biology and Oxygen Sensing, Department of Medicine, University of Chicago, USA. Professor Prabhakar, since 2009, is also the Director, Institutional Training Grant from National Institute of Health, Heart, Lung and Blood Institute. He is a leading authority on oxygen sensing mechanisms and physiological consequences of hypoxia. His discovery on mechanism of how intermittent hypoxia affects the oxygen sensing mechanisms at the carotid body truly made a revolution in the concept of low oxygen microenvironment in systems biology. Professor Greg Semenza and Professor Nanduri Prabhakar jointly worked and co-authored their research discoveries on HIF-1 and HIF-2 oxygen sensing mechanisms, which made Dr. Semenza to receive Nobel Prize in 2019. He has received several awards and honors, including Special Lecture at Nobel Institute for Physiology and Pharmacology, Stockholm, Sweden in 2019, just before Nobel Prize 2019 award ceremony. He is the recipient of Michael D. Berg Daily Prize from the Physiological Society UK, inaugural Kurt von Euler Lecture, Karolinska Institute, Stockholm, Sweden in 2014, Julius H. Komro Jr. Distinguished Lecture of the American Physiological Society, Ames New Delhi Silver Jubilee Oration Award, Neil S. Cherniak, Distinguished Pulmonary Lecture, Cleveland, Ohio, Professor A. S. Paintel, Oration Award from University of Delhi, and to mention, Honorary DSE for the year 2020 from BLD deemed to be university. Professor Prabhakar is a grant reviewer of various international government authorities. He is the consulting editor of Experimental Physiology, Journal of Physiology, Journal of Applied Physiology, and American Journal of Physiology. I hope your today's lecture will inspire young minds and take them on a journey to the most prestigious Nobel Prize Award. Here I present Professor Nanduri R. Prabhakar. Thank you, one and all. Thank you, ma'am. Now I call Honorable Pro Chancellor, sir. Dr. Jairad sir to kindly grace the dais with his presence. Now I request Dr. Sumangala Patil ma'am, HOD of Physiology Department and Vice Principal of Pre and Para Department. To escort the dais. Hmm. Now I request Honorable Pro Chancellor sir to present a bouquet as a token of appreciation to Professor Nanduri R. Prabhakar, sir. Sir, Now, it's time to listen to our renowned guest speaker, Professor Nanduri R. Prabhakar, sir. I request the Vice Chancellor, Professor Dr. R. S. Mudol, sir, and Pro Vice Chancellor, Dr. Arun C. Inamda, sir, to kindly chair the session. Over to you, sir.
Good morning, and this has been a great privilege and, a, and an honor to me to be here. And first of all, first of all, my thanks to the Pro Vice Chancellor, Vice Chancellor, and then Vice Chancellor and Dr. Kushal Das for inviting me and for their great hospitality, which I have been enjoying from the last one day. You have to apologize me because when I was traveling, I think I caught hold of some bug and some allergy, and I have some problem breathing, although I work on hypoxia, but I'm having one. So what today's program, since this is a medical institution, I thought that I will combine a sort of carotid body oxygen sensing and its implication of the sleep apnea as a sort of to understand and model the disease process and how it progresses and how carotid body can contribute to that rather than talking about the basic science. What is sleep apnea? Sleep apnea is basically characterized with a periodic cessation of breathing No? Okay. Okay, what is the pointer? This is pointer. Okay. Sleep apnea is characterized by periodic cessation of breathing, which can be either due to the obstruction of the upper airway, which is called as obstructive sleep apnea, or it can be disruption of the central respiratory rhythm generation in the brain or the central sleep apnea. Of these two forms, the obstructive sleep apnea or the OSA is a much more pre predominant form of sleep apnea as of the sleep disordered breathing. What causes the obstructive sleep apnea? The known factors are the compromised pharyngeal anatomy and inadequate upper airway muscle function. These are the well-established factors that potentially contribute to the obstructive sleep apnea. So why do you want to care about the, when you have a periodic cessation of breathing and sometimes they snore and their spouses complain that this guy is sleeping like hell and, and snoring, but it has a serious comorbidities. One of them is that they have highly elevated sympathetic nerve activity and they're prone to develop, majority of these people are prone to develop essential hypertension of the neurogenic hypertension. In addition, during every apneic period, which lasts more, no more than tens of seconds actually, there is a huge increase in the blood pressure as much as about 256 systolic and about 110 diastolic. And imagine that you have a very weak capillaries, then you are going to have a sort of stroke or the hemorrhagic stroke and that's where these people die in the morning time. So these are the sort of consequences of the obstructive sleep apnea. And what causes that? This major factor is the periodic desaturation of the oxygen, uh, arterial blood oxygen, or called as intermittent hypoxia. And if you treat the oxygenation by the continuous positive airway pressure, and majority of these patients, these comorbidities are suppressed, but some of them still have that. I will come to that point a little later. So the presentation, what I chose is that the carotid body 
which is a peripheral oxygen sensing structure, is a cause of the OSA as well as the mediator of the cardiovascular morbidity during the obstructive sleep apnea. These are the two points which I want to make it. So you may ask, what is the carotid body? Carotid body is a very small structure at the bifurcation of the common carotid artery and external carotid artery. External carotid artery. And as soon as you have a hypoxia in the arterial blood, the carotid body sensory nerve activity increases. And that information is related to the brainstem and reflexively stimulate the sympathetic nerve activity and the breathing. That is called as the carotid body chemoreflex. So this is a very brief introduction of the carotid body. Next few slides, I present evidence for carotid body as a cause of obstructive sleep apnea in a murine model as the mouse model. Can I get a pointer, better pointer, please? Yeah, it is not working. It doesn't work on the oh. <clears throat> We have been working on the enzyme heme oxygenase, which catalyzes the production of endogenous carbon monoxide, which is considered as gaseous transmitter. And we had a mice that lacks genetically the heme oxygenase enzyme. And we have been interested in monitoring their breathing. That was, our intention was not the sleep apnea, our intention is simply to see what happens to the breathing in these mice. And the top one, the white type mice, as you can see, and this is non-invasively monitoring with plethysmography and the mice are awake. And this is during the daytime and we monitor for eight hours. As you can see, the white type mice have a rather stable breathing, whereas the heme oxygen is knockout mice have a disrupted breathing, complete cessation, which I call it as apnea, and reduction in the tidal amplitude of the breathing, which is hypoapnea, which is, and then apnea. This pattern of breathing in the H4 to knockout mice is very characteristic of obstructive sleep apnea patient, and that information came from. Dr. Robert Thomas from Harvard. As you can see, there is a hypoapnea and there is a hypoapnea in the humans. And this is not a sporadic event. In fact, we did about 70 mice compared with the wild type mice. Nearly 60% of the H42 null mice, 42 out of 70 mice, showed more than 20 apneas per hour. In fact, some of them, the range is about 120 apneas per hour. That, that day when my colleague who was doing the experiment, he came and said that, hey, Nanduri, these animals are having huge apneas, huge. Then I thought, ah, it can't be. When we went there, this is one of the best models I could see that. And until then, there are very few models of obstructive sleep apnea experimentally available. So this one, as you can see, next one, boy, apneas are fine. And sometimes when we are recording for eight hours, this is the daytime and the mice sleep in the daytime. And 
they're awake in the night time, they're nocturnal animals. And sometimes when the breathing was very stable and sometimes they have severe apneas. Then I found from the literature, the mice really, the sleep pattern in the, in the nighttime, in the daytime is very sporadic. So how to prove that these apneas are occurring during sleep? So we implanted EEG electrodes and then we monitored the breathing continuously for about eight hours. Then as you can see that, the tidal volume monitored by uh, the plethysmography, and that is the EEG, and this is the EMG of the neck muscles, and the wake state is this one, and non-rapid eye movement sleep is this one, and rapid eye movement sleep is this. This is by the spectral analysis of the EEG. We can divide to the wakefulness, non-REM, and REM sleep. As you can see, the wild type mice, wild type mice had no apneas in the non-REM sleep and REM sleep. Unlike the wild type, the HO2 null mice, to start with during the wakeful night, wake, wake, wake state, they have a sort of a disrupted breathing. And they start developing apneas in the non-REM sleep. And in the REM sleep, it's worse. Apnea index is very high. So this proved the point that we have an experimental model for obstructive sleep apnea. The next question is that how do we know? It is known that the classical assumption, tacit assumption, I call it, is that the mouse never have any obstructive apneas. They thought all rodents have only central apneas. So we thought that we will try to prove that what we are seeing is a central apnea. But how to prove that? So if it is a central apnea, we can record from the diaphragmatic EMG, but in the mice, the diaphragm is so thin, you will call it the pneumothorax. So what we thought is that we implanted chronically electrodes in the intercostal muscle, inspiratory intercostal muscle. Then we monitored their breathing along with the plethysmography. As you can see that during six hours of breathing, 40% of the apneas, there is no airflow and complete absence of the electromyograph of the intercostal muscles. In contrast, 60% of them, they have apnea and cessation of airflow with an increase in the intercostal muscle activity, 60% of them. That is basically like a choking. That's what obstructive sleep apnea is. And then you have a sort of cessation of the airflow and respiratory effort becomes prominent. And so in this way, we can establish, these are very difficult experiment, put the chronic electrodes and record them for 10 days. So we could establish, first of all, the apneas do occur in sleep. Two, they are both obstructive and central phenotype. And obstructive phenotype predominates, 60% of them, predominates the central apneas. Having done that, then we noticed that the carotid body hypoxic sensitivity is very high in the Hitchporto null mice. There are just at that time the clinical reports start coming in the obstructive sleep apnea patients if they give hyperoxia, 100% oxygen for for about 30 minutes, 30 seconds or something like that. They can stabilize breathing in about 40% of the patients. That means hyperoxia silences the carotid body. So carotid body could be <coughs> a potential contributor to the obstructive sleep apnea. If that hypothesis is right, can we prove that in the murine mind, in this murine model? which has very hypersensitivity of the carotid body to hypoxia. That's what we did. A very simple experiment. 
the breathing room air, you can see the apneas here by triangles. Triangles. And when we give 90% oxygen hypoxia, which silences the carotid body, the breathing became very stable. In contrast, if you give a very mild hypo, hypo, hypoxia, 15%, the apneas became worse, more number of apneas. So this is the first evidence we have. Indeed, the carotid body could be contributing to the genesis of the apneas. So how about, then we thought that if we take off the carotid bodies, do we eliminate this apneas? But unfortunately, removing the carotid bodies was a lethal to the animals. All of them, they died. So one way of doing that is pharmacologically, blocking the hypersensitivity of the carotid body could be an option. So what we did is that that time we had another paper showing the signaling mechanism by which the carotid body senses hypoxia. In that scheme, we found the heme oxygenase function as an oxygen sensor. In the normoxic condition, heme oxygenase is very active, produces the carbon monoxide, which in turn activates cyclic uh, soluble gold cyclase and protein kinase G, which phosphorylates to the CAC, cystathione and gamma synthase, which produces hydrogen sulfide. By phosphorylating, it inhibits that, and then low H2S levels, low CB neural activity, and breathing. Whereas during hypoxia, the heme oxygenase gets inactivated. As a consequence, you have a very low SIBO production. And soluble gonadizes is less active, and protein kinase G phosphorylation is inhibited. We lift up the inhibition on the CAC enzyme and produce very high amount of hydrogen sulfide, which, like hypoxia, stimulates the carotid body activity. So, in that scenario, your heme oxygenase is a sensor. And hydrogen sulfide is a sort of an effector which causes the carotid body activation by hypoxia. In fact, the H4 to null mice have a very high amount of H2S, and which increases further with hypoxia. So we thought that you don't need an Einstein brain for that. How about the blocking the production of the H2S? can we normalize the carotid body sensitivity and bring back the apneas to the normal breathing? We did the experiment here. This is the Y-type mice carotid body response to hypoxia, which is denoted as HX. H4 to null mice have an exaggerated sensitivity. Whereas if you have a double knockout of H4 to and CSC, you don't have the hypersensitivity. This is one of the first proof that genetically, if you manipulate the enzyme, you can bring down the sensitivity of the carotid body. In fact, wild type mice, that is the breathing, H4 to null mice have a lot of apneas and hypoapneas. If you have a double knockout, H4 to and CSC, the breathing is absolutely stable. But obviously, genetic manipulation is not therapeutically valid. So can we do pharmacologically? Yell propargyl glycine, it is known for the last 20, 30 years, is a good inhibitor of the cystathione and gamma synthase, which produces hydrogen sulfide. So we gave, this is the vehicle treated animal, and we gave 30 milligrams per kilogram intraperitoneal. You reduce the apnea frequency. When we gave 90, 90 milligrams per kilogram intraperitoneal or water dose, water gavage, you completely stabilize breathing. And it is highly reversible. 
after 24 hours, once again, if you stop the galpropodial glycine, the animal goes back to FDS. So this is the first form of classical evidence indeed, without any manipulation, by cutting down the carotid body hypoxia, sensing you can normalize breathing. So this is my first part of the talk. <clears throat> this is the interim summary. H4 to neural mice exhibit high incidence of sleep apnea. Apnea index increases with age. That is what typically happens clinically too. And apnea of both obstructive and central phenotype in the H4 to neural mice. H4 to neural mice have an enhanced carotid body response to hypoxia. Hyperoxia stabilizes breathing. Hypoxia increases apnea index. Either genetic or former classical blockade of H2S synthesis stabilize breathing in H4 to null mice. These findings taken together suggest that heightened carotid body activation indeed contributes to the origin of obstructive sleep apnea. Then you may ask me one question. Why can't you use the LPAG as a therapeutic intervention for? It? Unfortunately, if you do the pharmacokinetics, that is mutagenic. So that is not an option. So we spent about three years. We made, based on the structure, a series of analogs. And then we found that much potent, is 100 times more potent than LPAG2 compounds. And the patent has been approved. And now we are waiting for the finances to take it to the clinic. So this is the first part of the story I'm sharing it with you. Next part is that the carotid body, as I showed in the beginning, the chemo reflux is a very potent activator of the sympathetic nerve activity and as well as the breathing. So, the carotid body is also a mediator of the downstream cardiovascular pathologies associated with obstructive sleep apnea. And as I showed in the beginning, they have a highly elevated sympathetic nerve activity, essential hypertension, and apnea during each episode of apnea. So how do you create, this was much before the story, that carotid body contributes to obstructive sleep apnea. So what is the major factor that could be contributing to the cardiovascular comorbidities in the obstructive sleep apnea patient? If you improve the periodic desaturation of the arterial blood with CPAP, some other patients respond to no hypertension. So that indicated that intermittent hypoxia could be one of the potent contributors to the cardiovascular pathology. So we went and treated the rodents, uh, particularly the rats and mice, with 15 seconds of hypoxia and arterial blood saturation in those mice fell down to 80%, which is very common in the obstructive sleep apnea patients. We monitored for eight, eight hours. And that is followed by five minutes of normoxy. <laughs> we gave nine episodes per hour, and we gave it for only during the sleep time, that is the daytime. We gave from morning 10 o'clock till evening 5 o'clock. And the rest of the time, they went back to the normoxy of the room air environment. Thank you. As you can see, that this is the blood pressure measured by telemetry. In the control animals, that is the blood pressure. And in the anesthetized condition, we monitor the splanchic sympathetic nerve activity. And after the chronic intermittent hypoxia for 10 days, you have an elevated blood pressure and high basal sympathetic nerve activity. In fact, if you give a very brief hypoxia simulating the apneic episodes, look at the blood pressure increase here. Ah. You can see in the bottom panel CH, there is huge increase in the blood pressure. 
And that phenotype is exactly resembling the obstructive sleep apnea patient. So we have a model with intermittent hypoxia. You can elicit this cardiovascular morbidity. So here in the initial experiments, uh, we ablated only the carotid body, keeping the carotid with a pin, take the pin and dip it and put it there and wait for about one week. As you can see that if you do the histology, tyrosine hydroxylase present glomus cells are there in the CB ablated animals, cryocoagulation, all of them are absent. These animals don't have an increased sympathetic nerve activity, nor an increase in the blood pressure with acute brief episode of hypoxia. In fact, you have a fall in the blood pressure. So this is the first concept. Oh, good. Okay. <clears throat> So these findings suggest that CH rodents, rodents recapitulate the sympathetic nerve activity and BP phenotype of OSA patients. Selective ablation of the carotid body prevents cardiovascular changes caused by chronic intermittent hypoxia, suggesting activation of the carotid body chemoreflex mediates the cardio cardiovascular responses to the chronic intermittent hypoxia, simulating obstructive sleep apnea. This activation of the carotid body chemoreflex could be either due to direct effect of the CAH on the carotid body or processing of the information in the brainstem neurons, the carotid body sensory information. And always the brain is a very confusing to me to really pinpoint out the problem. So I went and tried to do the carotid body itself. In fact, it's a very dramatic one. This is the control animal. When you gave hypoxia, yes, there is an increase in sensory nerve discharge. And in the CAH, exposed animals for 10 days, there is a marked sensitization of the carotid body response to hypoxia. In addition to that, if you give a very repetitive, brief hypoxic episode, simulating the apneas, the carotid body activity in the control animals increases, and after termination of 10 episodes, everything comes back to the control level. In sharp contrast, if you repeat that protocol in the CH conditioned animals, first of all, the hypoxic sensitivity is very high. And after stopping it, look at the carotid body, it goes on increasing. And that lasts at least, at least four to five hours. That means the long lasting sympathetic nerve activation could be because of this Sensory long-term facilitation, that's what we call this increase in the baseline sensory nerve activity. And this occurs despite maintaining the arterial blood gas levels. And you can see them even in the in vitro carotid bodies, suggesting that there is a remodeling of the carotid body function. And so these are the two main effects that happen with the intermittent hypoxia. Are these effects very selective for the intermittent hypoxia? So we went and exposed the animals to the chronic hypoxia, simulating the high altitude exposure of the hyperbaric hypoxia. We did not, yes, there is a sensitization initially, but there is no sensory long-term facilitation. Then we did it for continuous hypoxia four hours for, for about a couple of days. Once again, we did not see. All those things we reported back in uh, 
2005, 2003 paper in the PNS, 2003 Bangalore. Uh, that is the first paper there where we did the characterization. So if the continuous hypoxia is not doing it and chronic intermittent hypoxia is doing it, what is the difference between these two types of hypoxia? Oh, this is just to show that this phenomenon, the catheter body activity occurs with several days of uh, chronic intermittent hypoxia. It's like the disease model. You don't get in one day everything unless until you have a stroke. Right? Second, severity hypoxia used for IH condition has very little impact. That means whether your oxygen saturation is 80% or 60% or 70%, that doesn't matter. It is still hitting the carotid body. And CAH had no effect on the carotid body morphology, gross morphology. And similar thing, they were also reported by uh, Rodrigo Triaga and Del Rio's group from Chile. And almost after our work, they prompted and they took over that. So what is the cellular basis for this remodeling of the carotid body function? What is this intermittent hypoxia? It is sort of denoted by normoxia followed by hypoxia, whereas that does not occur with continuous hypoxia. It is a sort of taking an analogy from ischemia reperfusion, where they attributed the release of reactive oxygen species during the reoxygenation phase. Is that the analogy correct in this? type of chronic intermittent hypoxia. So we postulated that ROS generated during the reoxygenation phase could be the major culprit for the remodeling of the current body function eliciting to the cardiovascular comorbidity. If that hypothesis is correct, then the chronic intermittent hypoxia should increase the active oxygen species levels in the current body. Two, if you scavenge reactive oxygen species, you should have a normal carotid body function. Third, if you exogenously give the reactive oxygen species, you should be able to mimic the effect of the chronic intermittent hypoxia. Let us see. Carotid body is wonderful to talk about, but it is a miserably small tissue. In the mice, it weighs about 25 micrograms. In the rat, it is about 60 micrograms. So we have developed all the biochemical assays. In fact, Dr. Kumar was a colleague of mine. And that time, actually, um, Helmut Acker was visiting me from Germany. And he suggested, why don't you do the aconitase enzyme? Aconitase enzyme is, gets inactivated it's an iron sulfur containing enzyme. In response to reactive oxygen species, you inactivate the enzyme, and that can be used as an index of the ROS generation. So we did the MDA as well as the quantities, as you can see that as you one day, three days, 10 days of intermittent hypoxia, there is a progressive increase in the reactive oxygen species. Second, if you treat the animals, with a raw scavenger, that is MN TMPYP. As you can see, first of all, the control animals which received the vehicle, they have an exaggerated sensitivity to the current body and a robust sensory long term facilitation. But if you treat all the 10 days during the exposure to intermittent hypoxia with MN and PP, that phenotype is completely gone. So the second criteria is that Ross scavenger indeed blocks the response of the carotid body to intermittent hypoxia. And the third criteria is a very simple experiment. We took the carotid bodies in vitro, monitored five episodes of hypoxia. There is an increase in sensory nerve activity, which promptly came back to the control. And then we gave H2O2, 500 nanomolar, 
for about half an hour. Nothing much happened on the baseline activity. But while you are continuing H2O2, then if you give intermittent hypoxia five episodes, look at that. There is a robust activation of sensory nerve activity and robust induction of sensory long term facilitation. So the point here is that exogenous administration of ROS indeed mimics the effects of chronic intermittent hypoxia. These three evidences strongly suggest that reactive oxygen species generated during the reoxygenation phase is indeed contributing to the carotid body morphology, pathology. Next question is that, how do the intermittent hypoxia increases ROS? The reactive oxygen species cellular level is, is a balance between the production of the reactive oxygen species by prooxidants and destroying the reactive oxygen species by antioxidant enzymes. So the ROS levels, the balance between these two factors controls the cellular redox state. During intermittent hypoxia, this balance is tilted. Prooxidant capacity goes up, antioxidant capacity goes down. And what are the mechanisms? It's a very long story. I'm cutting short to two slides. One is the first initial stage. There are three stages. Initial stage is a non-transcription effect, which when it continues, recruits the transcriptional mechanism. If it still continues, then you recruit epigenetic phenomena. So it is like a simple progression of the disease. So I'm going to show you the evidence. Non-transcriptional mechanisms. We found that intermittent hypoxia in the initial stages activates xanthine oxidase enzyme activity. And the ROS generated by that xanthine oxidase activity increases cytosolic calcium. And cytosolic calcium in turn activates NADPH oxidase 2 which further increases cytosolic calcium. And the calcium goes into the mitochondria, inhibits the complex one of the electron transport chain, and further increases ROS. In the time course is that xanthine oxidase activity, the reactive oxygen species generated by that mechanism is very short lasting. It's about less than an hour. Everything comes back to normal. With NADPH oxidase that is longer, and with the mitochondrial electron transport chain blocking, that takes about 18 hours to come back to the control. So it is a positive feedforward mechanism. ROS induced ROS is the non transcription first stage of the mechanism. Once if that is activated, this ROS disrupts the hypoxia inducible factor one alpha, it increases markedly, whereas the HIF2 alpha, which is um, synonymous to the HIF1 alpha, it actually goes down. The mechanism, what it does is that ROS increases the cytosolic calcium, actually through the PLC gamma and IP3 mechanism, and this calcium increases mTOR activity, mammalian target of rapamycin, which phosphorylates the S65 and increases the protein synthesis of the hifan alpha protein, and thereby it causes increase in the hifan alpha levels during the intermittent hypoxia. And recently, Dr. Jenan very reported that intermittent hypoxia also activates the um, H tag histone deacetylase activity, leading also to the increased hepan alpha protein. But at the same time, the calcium activates the calpins, which are the proteases, which degrades the hip 2 alpha. That's how the hip 2, hip 2 alpha levels goes down. And then we also delineated in the molecule of the hip 2 alpha protein, which residues are susceptible 
to the Calpin, but I'm not going into the details of that. So what are the consequences of this imbalance in the hypoxia inducible factor one and two alpha? To cut the story short, the increased hefan alpha transcriptionally activates the pro-oxidant enzymes, genes particularly the NADPH oxidase two and four, whereas the HIF2 alpha is a very potent transcription activator of antioxidant enzymes. When that goes down, all the antioxidant enzymes levels go down. We monitor around seven of them. And so as a consequence, pro-oxidant levels goes up transcriptionally, antioxidant enzymes levels goes down. As a consequence, you have an increased loss in augmented colored body activity. This is only biochemically, but we have proof physiologically with the HIP1 knockout mice as well as the HIP2 knockout mice, which I am not showing the data today. Now, then how does this ROS signaling is activating the carotid body? What is the target? And that actually we did in a 2015 paper uh, and then in 2017 paper. It's remarkable that ROS is actually inactivating, like hypoxia. ROS is nothing but a metabolite of oxygen, the active oxygen species. It is inactivating H4O2 and markedly increasing H2S. And so, if that hypothesis is that ROS is inactivating H4O2, decreases CO levels, markedly increases H2S levels. If that is the culprit for this pathology, if you treat the rats with l propargyl glycine and you treat them with intermittent hypoxia, there is no sensitization of the current body response and no induction of long-term facilitation. Always one can criticize the pharmacological approaches. So we went to the genetic approach. Mice lacking the CSC exactly displays the same phenotype. This is a wild type mice. Wild type mice exposed to IH have sensitization of the hypoxic response and long term facilitation. And that phenotype is totally absent in the CSC knockout mice. How about the cardiovascular morbidity? Here is the control animal. And this is the blood pressure responses and splanchnic sympathetic nerve activity. It is the brief episodes of hypoxia we gave at the black bar. As you can see, small increase in blood pressure. After 10 days of intermittent hypoxia, the basal blood pressure is elevated with very brief episodes of hypoxia simulating the apneas, robust increase in the blood pressure and sympathetic nerve action. If you treat these animals with l glycine for 10 days, look at that. There is no increase in the basal blood pressure. With every episode of hypoxia, there is actually decrease in blood pressure and no increase in sympathetic nerve activity. And this is a 2016 paper. So in other words, by cutting down the carotid body, oh, sorry, preventing the sensitization of the carotid body is blocking the cardiovascular pathophysiology caused by intermittent hypoxia. So summary is that reactive oxygen signaling is a major cellular mechanism underlying the calorie body activation by intermittent hypoxia. IH increases ROS initially by non-transcriptional mechanism involving ROS-induced ROS or the positive feed-forward mechanism. ROS generated by non-transcriptional mechanism leads to dysregulated HIF1 and HIF2 transcription of pro and antioxidant enzymes. ROS activates the carotid body through H2S signaling, leading to the hypersensitivity of the carotid body. Now, that was one of the time I came across Robert Thomas from Harvard came to visit me. He's a hardcore sleep physician. I was asking, okay, when you put the CPAP 
it is very uncomfortable and these people even 100% of the people are pure he said no there is always a residual one so how is it he said you should be able to figure it out then it occurred to me all the time you are giving candidates of intermittent hypoxia how about giving it for 30 days to see if it is effects are reversible Ten days is completely reversible. So that is the simple experiment we did. Is that short-term intermittent hypoxia, given it for 10 days, CB response is elevated, and the reactive oxygen species are elevated. If you give 10 days of recovery in the room air, everything came back to control. Look at that, instead of 10 days, we gave it for 30 days. Then the carotid body response is highly elevated. Then we gave it 30 days in the room air recovery. Carotid body activity did not come down. So as the reactive oxygen species levels. It is a, what is this quasi permanent stage? What mechanisms could be contributing to that? That could explain why CPAP is not always, when you enter into the clinic, you don't know how long you were having Start to sleep apnea. Only when it becomes severe, then you go to see the physician. So we hypothesized that time we know that that there is an epigenetic phenomena. Epi means above the genetic and transcriptive mechanism. There are three major types of epigenetic phenomena that can lead to long-lasting or often irreversible changes. One is the DNA methylation, another one is histone modification. We thought that epigenetic mechanism could be contributing to the long lasting effects. And we initially concentrated, I'm not showing the rest of the data, but initially we concentrated on the DNA methylation of antioxidant enzymes. DNA, I mean, majority of the antioxidant enzymes. They have a consensus sequence in the promoter region that potentially contributing to the methylation of the DNA and thereby suppressing the gene transcription. And here is the antioxidant gene expression, SOD1, SOD2, catalase, and thioredoxin, PRDX, and GPX. As you can see, that with the long-term intermittent hypoxia, all the genes, all the genes are down-regulated. And then we went in each gene, we did the DNA methylation. As you can see that all the genes that have suppressed um, transcriptionally, they have an increased, majority of them, they have an increased DNA methylation. Then we found out the which part of the DNA methylation islands and everything. So that, that part is fine. And then the, the, the carotid body is coming into play. Carotid body directly affected by age, but the impulses goes to the brain. And when we monitor the DNA methylation in the brain region that receives the input from the carotid body, we have exactly the same phenotype as I showed you. But if you cut the carotid body nerve, the gene epigenetic regulation is completely absent. And that paper was published in 2018 in J-Physiology, afferent and efferent limbs. So that is another aspect of the carotid body. So this is what we show the chemoreflex pathway is the afferent limb, central limb, and efferent limb is Adrenomedalus and organ of the sympathetic nervous system. CH increases ROS generation through hip dependent mechanism in the central and efferent limbs of the CB chemoreflex, as well as the DNA methylation of antioxidant enzymes in the central and the efferent limbs of the CB chemoreflex. Third body ablation blocks hip dependent ROS generation and DNA methylation by long term intermittent hypoxia. So far, nobody ever said that the HIFs and DNA methylation controlled by the neural activity coming from the periphery. That is a new, a totally different new concept. These findings suggest that 
Current body activation is necessary for the transcriptional and epigenetic regulation of gene expression in the central and efferent limbs of the chemoreflex pathway. The cardiovascular responses to the short term CH are reversible, whereas those long term CH are quasi permanent. Quasi permanent effects of long term CH are in part due to the epigenetic regulation of antioxidant gene transcription by DNA methylation. I said in part because I haven't showed you the data with the histone modifications of that, that goes on for another half an hour. So keratin body is indeed required for CH induced ROS generation, HIF dependent transcription and epigenetic regulation in the central and efferent limb of the CB tumor reflex. This is all as a spokesperson of the laboratory I'm presented, but the main work is then Dr. Pang is an excellent neurophysiologist and the keratin body nerve in the mice is about 1.5 millimeters. And he is one, he picks up a single axons from that. And Ganesh Kumar was my right hand man, was a professor of biochemistry in my institute. And he is the one who developed all the biochemical assays necessary for that. And Jane Anduri, who is the professor of cell biology, she is the responsible for all the epigenetics and genetic factors. And Goshan Guvan was done the transcription factor. And there are David McCormick and Miguel were uh, co investigators in the grant given by the NIH to develop potential pharmacotherapy uh, for preventing the sleep apnea. All the pharmacokinetic work and everything is done at the IAD. And Robert Thomas was a hardcore sleep physician who was always my consultant. I'm not a clinician, I'm a basic scientist. And uh, at the Johns Hopkins, Saul Snyder was the one who provided me the CSE knockout mice as well as the H42 knockout mice. And Greg was part of my PPG program project. And, uh, and he was sort of project concerned with the heat transcription with Jane Anduri. So this work is supported by two major grants, program project grants, and the cadet grant from the NIH. Thank you very much indeed for your attention. Thank you, sir, for enriching us with your wise words. No. Uh, thank you, Dr. Nanduri Prabhakar. Wonderful lecture and basic research. And uh, many of us were not knowing the carotid uh, body sensing the oxygen. Wonderful. And uh, may I have some questions from the audience? Uh, there are anesthetists are there. ENT group is there. And also... Kindly maintain silence, students. Few questions. Just feel free to ask me any question. I'm not that perfect. You can point out with the wrong names. One thing I want to say is that this is only an example of the obstructive sleep apnea, but the philosophy behind these experiments can be used to understand the disease progression for any type of disease. It just requires putting the figures, what is the basic physiology underlying a particular disease and how, and how to decide head of that physiology to lead to pathology and see, go from whole organ to cellular level. That, that's, that's the message I want to pass on to you. If there are no questions, uh, one or two clarifications from uh, anybody? Uh, Professor Prabhakar, thank you very much for uh, exemplary research. Anyway, we know that you are a member of the Nobel Forum, so automatically and also you are very closely attached to the Nobel Institute, being yourself as a fellow of the Nobel Institute, Karolinska, and your career. So your, these things we 
uh, neat and many things we'll be actually discussing in that forum uh, in our today's evening medical education unit will be conducting interaction with some panel discussion where you will be there as a chief panelist and with supported by uh, many other senior professors and young scientists, young minds. Uh, I do not want to, uh, because as though nobody is asking questions, so I don't want to ask directly any questions, but it is very curious to know the regulation, regulation of ox oxygen sensing mechanism, specifically by the epigenetics. This is one of the very interesting observe you, your laboratory, thanks to Jayasri that to did the great work. And along with the connection to the central nervous system, because we totally in physiology book or in a respiratory medicine book, pulmonary medicine, we read separately. One is the chemical regulation, other is the neuronal regulation and their influences are totally auto cut. We never discuss together in a synthesized form. This is the unique thing which I noticed in your uh, this presentation that central nervous system, its regulations to raw this the uh, sleep apnea via CIH mechanism and involvement of epigenetics. So these regulations, when you discovered, when you invented that there is a role of the respiratory regulatory center of the brain. Do you think here any role of the ninth and 10th cranial nerve as an afferent sensing or out, outcome from the cardiovascular system to the brain, specifically the internal capsule to stimulate or inhibit when the sensation is going on a different way? Means oxygen is in, oxygen is out. In that situation, in fact, we delineated the mechanism how the neural traffic coming from the carotid body could be contributing to the trans activation of the transcription by hips. We could do that relatively easy in the peripheral different limb, that is the adrenal medulla, because the cells are uniform. You have a cortex and you have a medulla. But to do that in the central nervous system is going to be a challenge because you have the glial cells and you have the neurons. In our 2014 paper, we could show by immunocytochemistry, it is not in the glia, it is the neurons that is being affected. And the very signaling mechanism recently, Fred Garcia, who is an assistant professor in our department, uh, whom I recruited some time back. And he figured out in the hippocampus how the carotid body neural traffic is affecting the NMDA receptors and changing the plasticity of the hippocampal neurons. Perhaps the same thing could be doing in the brainstem neurons too. But I do not know. It's a very tough experiment to do that and to eliminate the glia and looking only at the neuron is going to be a challenging task. That's a tough job. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Prabhakar, uh, one question as a clinician. Many tracheostomy I have done. Huh? Tracheostomy. You know that uh, there is obstruction exactly. for the respiration yeah. due to the various reasons. Uh -huh. Soon after the tracheostomy, mm -hmm. and patient goes for the apnea. Full oxygen, they are giving everything. And uh, my anesthetist will agree 100% oxygen they are giving, patient goes for apnea. In that situation, instead of giving oxygen, they will go for the carbon dioxide support. Mm -hmm. Is there any role of the sensing of the carbon dioxide by the carotid body or only central regulations? I think that could be one thing. First of all, when you do the tracheostomy, if there is a sort of a chronic irritation to the superior laryngeal, superior laryngeal, which is just very close to the trachea, and we know from ages, superior laryngeal is a potent inhibition of breathing. It causes apnea. That is well-known fact. 
and why it is able to overcome by that. Yes, CO2 sensing neurons in the brainstem, rostral ventral medulla, that can overcome the happiness. But carotid body sensing by CO2 is very minimal. The, the real yeah. stimulation is coming from the brain. What I want to tell is that uh, no injury to the superior laryngeal or uh, whatever laryngeal nerves. It is because of the, there is no stimulation, central stimulation. Most of the, our ENT colleagues and respiratory colleagues and uh, anesthesia colleagues, immediately they will stimulate the central system by the carbon dioxide. Yeah, carbon dioxide. Uh, is, the, is your, uh, uh, the uh, research has, taken cognizance of the any CO2 into this? We tried. No, no. Because apnea, yes, it is apnea, have... carotid body, oxygen sensing. Yes. Was but... there anything carbon dioxide sensing or other way around? Because practically we do see patient comes with such a stridor, hunger for the oxygen, to do the bypass of the obstruction, immediately patient goes into the apnea. If you leave, he will be dead. So immediately our anesthesia colleagues, they know that immediately they stimulate him by giving the amount of carbon right. dioxide. Okay. We tried uh, that because... All of the your experience uh, is the cognizance of the CO2 has taken or uh, that's what my uh, thing. That is one of the question every time they ask me is that when you have obstructive sleep apnea, not only you have hypoxemia, but you also have elevated CO2. Then my question to the clinician is that, did they ever measure how much is the rise in the CO2 during apneic episodes? My, so far, none of the clinicians I talk, either nationally in the US or outside, they don't have any idea. So we try to add CO2. The animals became acidotic. They are worse. Like, see, how, how much CO2 do we need to use it? Then I found out a picture in the North, North, Northern Clinics of America. There is a picture where they monitored the CO2. I unlocked the figure and calculated. It is seven millimeters of mercury. That is in the human. How much that comes to the mice or rat? How much I have to reduce that? But for all practical purposes, whether we use only intermittent hypoxia or intermittent hypoxia combined with CO2 is one and the same. So that's why we're satisfied. But what is the central component coming out from this one? I do not know. Yeah. So, so, well, uh, thank you very much uh, because sir. we have to understand carbon sir. dioxide retention. No, I'll give you. Carbon dioxide retention, all of us know that in the COVID also, uh, oxygen showing 95, 96, but there is a carbon dioxide retention. Is that mechanism is helping us? Research, further research. Or obstructive sleep, when it is there, bypass the obstruction, you go for the apnea. And what is that, the mechanism, how much is required? Again, research topic. Is there any role of the carotid body like things, stimulation, and we are very happy that uh, the carotid body, we we contemplating it something it secretes and also that it uh, produces the carotid body tumor. But, oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. But uh, we we have seen that amazing research by you and uh, uh, oh. very thankful to you. And uh, I think one more question by our uh, Dr. audience. Keith. Sir, uh, I have read that... Uh, Sleep apnea and carotid body sensation, this problem, complications of it uh, will lead to hypertension, cardiac problems, and also type 2 diabetes. Oh, yeah. That is what is the link? It um, appears very remote. How is, what is the link for type 2 diabetes? I can, uh, we have few understand. papers on that, type 2 diabetes, because the effect is through the carotid body affecting the sympathetic nervous system which affects the insulin resistance. And there are two factors for the type 2 diabetes. One is the pancreatic beta cells. Other one is the insulin resistance. When there is an imbalance, then you get a type 2 diabetes. We have delineated some mechanisms. Still, the work is going on on the type 2 diabetes. 
And in fact, following the same lines, Silvia Conde from Portugal, she denervated the carotid bodies and she did have the glucose resist, glucose levels normalized in the so-called type two diabetic type of rats by intermittent hypoxia. She had she published a few papers on that. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, sir, it was a wonderful talk. Uh, there are many messages, take home messages for all youngsters and also our uh, learned staff. One thing is sure that to conduct any basic research needs a lot of dedication, time, and patience. Number two, the way he was trying to answer the research hypothesis and answering with the evidence of uh, experimental models. And what I like more is the interim summary after every deduction of uh, each hypothesis that gave connectivity and, uh, and also little clinical implication how this research will help as a translational research for the practical utility. It is a wonderful talk, sir. We are really honored by your presence and uh, uh, lucid uh, research. Thank, thank you. you. Uh, thank you very much, sir. Thank you, sir. BLD deemed to be university had conferred honorary doctor of science to Professor Nanduri R. Prabhakar, sir, on the occasion of 8th convocation on August 2020 virtually. Now, it's a proud moment and honor to confer and felicitate Professor Nanduri R. Prabhakar, sir, with Doctor of Science in person. So, I now request controller of examination to kindly take over the proceedings. Good morning, one and all. So, as you all know, that eighth convocation held on 26th August of 2020, B, uh, Sir was a chief guest for the convocation, eighth convocation, and uh, BLD University conferred the doc, uh, honorary con, uh, or doctoral degree to uh, Sir. Uh, the convocation was online because of COVID pandemic, and uh, hence, uh, now as Sir is with us. So I request Honorable uh, Jaira Sir, uh, Pro Chancellor, and Honorable VC Sir and Dr. R.S. Mudhar, Honorable uh, Dean Faculty of Medicine, Arvind Patil Sir, to uh, hand over the certificate and the memento to Sir. Thank you, Sir.
Sir, I request you to kindly say a few lines. Thank you, sir. Few minutes. Just to respond to the <laughs> respected Pro Chancellor, Vice Chancellor, the Dean, and ladies and gentlemen, it has been a great privilege and indeed an honor for me to be bestowed with this highest award. And thank you very much. I <clears throat> most delightfully and humbly, I accept this award. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you so much, sir. Now I would like to invite Dr. Jyoti Ma'am, Coordinator, Center of Yoga and Exercise Science, Associate Professor, Department of Physiology, to deliver a vote of thanks. Namaste to all. Gratitude, gratitude is not only the greatest of virtues, but the parent of all others. I deem it a great honor and privilege to propose the vote of thanks on this memorable occasion. Let me first of all start by giving glory to the Almighty God for making today's occasion a resounding success. First and foremost, I owe special gratitude to our guest of honor, Professor Nanduri R. Prabhakar, sir, Harold Hines, Endo Professor of Medicine and Director, Center for Systems Biology and Oxygen Sensing, University of Chicago, for accepting our invitation and raising the occasion. Thank you so much, sir, for enriching. We are grateful to our Honorable Chancellor, Pro-Chancellor Sir, Professor Vayam Jairaj for support and encouragement. I extend heartfelt thanks to Honorable Vice-Chancellor, Professor Dr. R.S. Mudol Sir for valuable contribution. I thank Honorable Pro-Vice-Chancellor, Professor Dr. Arun C. Namdar Sir for continued support. I extend my gratitude to the Registrar, Professor Dr. R.V. Kulkarni, sir, for his kind support. My heartfelt thanks to our Dean Faculty of Medicine and Principal, Dr. Arvind Patil, sir, for their unstinted support for this function. I extend thanks to Team Controller of Examination. I owe special gratitude to Professor Kushal K. Das, sir, a distinguished chair, Professor BLD deemed to be university for being instrumental to organize this occasion. Thank you, sir. I thank all the distinguished invitees, principals of all sister institutions, head of various departments, faculty and students for being a part of this memorable occasion. I thank the members of media center and IT department who have worked behind the screen. I thank non-teaching staff who have worked hard ensure that this occasion becomes a memorable success. Once again, I thank you all for your attention. Thank you all. Thank you so much. So kindly stand up for national anthem.
This is me, Saili, and Rishit, signing off. Thank you.